Today's video is a bit of fun. For once, we're going to talk about Mortal Kombat guest characters, but not in the usual sense. Situations where characters from other games, movies or comics make it into Mortal Kombat for one-off appearances are usually what we know as guest characters in NRS titles. But this video goes into the journey of three Mortal Kombat characters that were guest stars in the Injustice series. Scorpion, Sub-Zero and Raiden would appear as guest characters. Scorpion in Injustice Gods Among Us and Sub and Raiden appearing in Injustice 2 years later. Their spots in the respective rosters would be quite interesting to me as a long-time MK fan, seeing how their moves would be transferred over and Honestly, seeing how these characters would function in a totally different game. Injustice known for its slightly slower pace compared to Mortal Kombat, the fact that it's a back-to-block game rather than block button, the clash system and other mechanics that would be unique to the franchise up until that point. Each character had their own identity, and in competitive play things would get even more interesting still. I remember when each of these characters made their debut in the competitive prime time of the Injustice games, one by one. The community reactions, the balance changes, the salt, pretty much a mix of everything, where all we have left are the stories to tell. Welcome to today's video where I break down the three times Mortal Kombat characters were playable in the Injustice series. Starting off strong, we begin with Scorpion in the first Injustice that was released in 2013. Scorpion himself added to the game after Lobo and Batgirl had already had their additions to the game's roster. Now, I'm not sure how many people know or even remember Scorpion in this game, but he definitely had one of the most interesting stories for a DLC character because he went from one of the best characters in the game to one of the weakest in a single patch. One swift stroke took most of his power and turned it into something not worth using compared to other characters that had similar strengths. Before we get into that though, let's talk about his basics. As the latest MK title in 2013 was Mortal Kombat 9, a lot of Scorpion's moves would be taken from that game and altered to fit in a different style. New moves were added as well, but if you didn't play Injustice, but you did play Mortal Kombat 9, you'll probably recognize a lot of the stuff that I'm about to show you. However, remember that this game is back or down to block, and there's only three attack buttons and trait. Scorpion had a lot of special moves. His spear returns, as you would expect, but you had to meter burn the spear for it to stun. Teleport comes back, and it's still super plus on hit, which is his main mix-up tool after a combo, but the meter burn teleport will launch. Now, we know that Scorpion relies on meter burn teleport a lot these days since MKX or MK11, but this is one of the first times he had to do it for combo starters. The unblockable Hellfire, the air throw, takedown, his flip kick would be a standalone special here rather than a string ender in MK9, Loads of Scorpion's attacks made their way back and functioning as you'd expect them to, with Flip Kick being his main wake-up attack. Strings are where things get kind of spicy. He once again has some strings that are right out of Mortal Kombat 9. Uh, some of them have the built-in overheads where his takedown offers a mix-up there, although very unsafe. But the important thing is his improved mix-up game from MK9 due to his ability to loop things more efficiently. Back 1 is his low kick from MK9, but it has a confirmable follow-up now, something he didn't have in the previous game. The universal forward 3 overhead is decent, but he has his own launching overhead in back 2. This one lets him dash in and continue the combo, again looping into more mix-ups afterwards. There is a new launcher in this game which tends to be used for his damage output, especially in the final patch, but the final two buttons that I want to mention are his jumps because these had a huge change from launch to where we are now. Jump 1 is a standard jump kick style attack, but it can cross up. This is a tool that you'd use if you're going for an ambiguous cross up or something. Jump 3 is a circular sword swing that is very different now compared to when he released. We can dive into these moves very, very soon, but keep these in your mind for now. 
finally, every character in Injustice has a trait, something unique to them. Scorpions is the Hellfire. It will tick damage over time. Sure, but the best thing about it was that it would stun the opponent and allow for follow-ups, and the most important strength being that it recaptured after a launch. This trait is incredibly important because it takes the base mix-up game of Scorpion and it puts an extra option on top of it, combining the teleport, the environment interactions, spear and trait Scorpion had a lot of ways to combo you, but also end the combo in a restand and open up for the 50-50 between overhead or low, or the strange cross-ups that you can do from his jump one. Now, there's always more to go into here, but the fact is, Scorpion is a mix-up character with super bad walk speed, but a fast jump and very fast dashes. His entire game plan is landing the one hit and mixing you up until the end of the round. He was already kind of known as a Vortex character in MK9 to a degree, but this was really pushed to the next level in Injustice. Now rather than going into his current and final version now, I want to quickly take you back to 2013 for a second because you have to see the before and after of this character strength-wise. When Scorpion released, there was outrage over how overpowered this character was seen to be. Not everybody totally echoed this statement. Competitive players can often have the mindset of, hey look, it's new and we need to learn how to fight it, which is completely fair enough. But I need to explain what this character had when they first launched, because looking back, it was kind of outrageous. Flip Kick was a minus one on block wake up attack. Basically, it's safe. You'd need to preemptively armor or try to make it whiff to punish it. Remember that Scorpion is a volatile, mobile character, so having to do something like this gave him even more freedom even when he was the one that was knocked down. Teleport used to hit mid. Well, according to these patch notes it did. In a lot of tournament footage, it's been seen to whiff even back then, but I'm still going to list it as I read it. An already agile character who's jumping all over the place had a side-switching special that on meter burn will launch and combo. Yes, you can hold down to block the instant teleport, but remember, instant jump-ins would hit overhead and kill you, so you were kind of stuck in the mud here against pre-patch Scorpion. Teleport had less recovery back then too. Online, having input delay made this horrible to try and deal with, but even offline, players were seen to struggle quite a lot. A major, major factor of launch Scorpion was that his jump 1 and jump 3 hitboxes were absolutely massive. We'd see the jump 3 hit from all over the place because it has that circular motion, right? The jump 1 hit super low to the ground, so instant jump 1 overhead into teleport mix-up would happen all the time. He had at the time some of the most absolute powerful jumping attacks in the game, and a teleport that made you scared to move or press a button. Injustice had four bars of meter versus MK9's three, so you could be extremely trigger happy with how often you use teleport in the first place. It was a nightmare. The one single tournament where we saw Scorpion at his most powerful was CEO in 2013, shortly after Scorpion was released. Unfortunately, CEO has a bit of a record with infamous top 8s for Netherrealm, as a few years later we would have had the Tanya situation with MKX. Either way, four Scorpion players made up this top 8, and all of the mad stuff the character could do was on full display. Important to note that Scorpion didn't actually win this tournament, however he was heavily used and we would hear constant boos from the crowd after every successful game a Scorpion player achieved. For the most part. It's also worth noting that Scorpion wasn't the only character used by the likes of CD Jr, Perfect Legend, or Deg for instance. They all used other characters as well, but it was the Scorpion picks when brought out that had such a negative response from the crowd. With a hotfix and full patch combined, Scorpion would get utterly obliterated. Teleport was nerfed heavily, Flip Kick became unsafe on block, his damage would become much lower in general. Even lower, as for a time, his combos were incorrectly scaling at double the rate, giving him 20% combos. Exciting! 
The Jump 1 and Jump 3 would both have their hitboxes butchered, so they didn't have anywhere near the same effectiveness they once did. Long story short, everything about this character was heavily toned down, and that leads me to the final part of Scorpion's story. As of right now, Scorpion tends to be considered the one weakest character in the entire game. It is often a misconception that Joker was the worst here, but he wasn't bad, online just made Joker seem weaker than he actually was. That's a story for another time though. Scorpion's mix-up game was incredibly unsafe as the instant jump-in mix-ups could no longer be done, making you have to resort to the more unsafe overhead low option. His combo damage, although fixed from the double scaling, was still low in general, and to play his game plan the way you're supposed to, you had to plow through meter like there's no tomorrow. Spending all of your meter for barely 30% a touch meant that you never had bar for anything else. Least of all, the clash, where Scorpion would never, ever clash favorably. He didn't have the meter to do so, and you compare that with all of the top tier characters that didn't have to spend their bar on combos, there was no way he was going to win those exchanges. He was outmixed, outdamaged, outneutraled, and outresourced. There was not one single thing Scorpion did that wasn't done by someone else better. A fall from grace is an understatement, and to this day, no character in the history of Netherrealm had such a drastic change in their viability in one single patch, from arguably number one to bottom one in the blink of an eye. Five years later, Injustice 2 would release after the hugely successful Mortal Kombat X. MK-themed guests return, with Sub-Zero launching first. Now, there actually isn't as much progression in the character's meta compared to Scorpion because, to be honest, almost no character in NRS had such a severe transformation competitively. But Sub is still a really neat character, mostly because of just how transferable the game plan was across MKX to Injustice 2, as, like Scorpion, many, if not all of the moves here, were taken directly from Sub-Zero's previous appearance, a true legacy character. Let's go over the basics again to show you what we're working with. Ice Ball is a damaging projectile on its own now, but like Scorpion and Injustice, you have to meter burn the Ice Ball to make it stun this time. Slide is exactly the same, but in this game it will send the opponent flying back behind him, and when amplified, will simply do more damage. Shatter is used for ending things on block, but it actually has a meter burn version in this game, giving it more pushback and more chip damage. Air Hammer from Cryomancer makes a return, hitting overhead and then mid in short succession, and possibly the most important special move, Cryomancer's command grab is also present. Meter burn this to freeze them in place, and this, after a juggle, will restand, which is why it's so good. It wouldn't be injustice without the trait though, would it? Of which Sub-Zero's is the game changer for his whole design. Ice Clone is Sub-Zero's trait, where like MKX he can throw it and use Shatter to send a blast forward. Unlike MKX, this clone can be used airborne. And not only that, but it can be meter burned to create two clones instead of one. The clone isn't out for a huge amount of time, but it regenerates very fast which is important as the clone is instrumental to his entire design, and the main thing that really keeps him viable versus a lot of the cast. Outside of specials, a great deal of his MKX strings come back, but some are missing, like his launching overhead back two, for example. The two hit low, his confirmable mid, various other normals and strings that are used for both pressure and combo conversions work the way players were used to in MKX, so a large amount of this kit was completely transferable. You just needed to be used to injustice mechanically because there's no run button, right? And the game as a base was extremely different in terms of screen size, neutral, I mean, it's slower than MKX, so Sub was played a bit differently because of it. In terms of the meta, Sub-Zero's jump attacks are quite strong. Sub could use the jump 2 to get in and start pressuring on the ground, it can cross up as well. Moves on block into shatter for pressure and chip damage, 
But the main goal is to make sure that you're setting up the clone as often as possible, because it's what gives him that edge in high-level matches. Clone being a total obstacle just like in Mortal Kombat games made Sub-Zero really annoying versus characters that didn't have a projectile or maybe they had bad mobility. It wasn't like MKX which had loads of multi-hitting armored attacks either. Armored back threes or forward threes would only have a single hit on them. So often in tournament play, players would try and armor out of clone setups, the clone eats the armor and Sub's attack will just get a free hit instead. The main Sub-Zero player that most people would think of in Injustice 2 was Buffalo, who was a Sub-Zero main from MKX as well. In fact, he's always used Sub in Mortal Kombat. There were of course other Sub players, don't get me wrong, but he was often seen the most consistently in high-level exhibitions or community tournaments like the legendary War of the Gods. In matchups that Sub-Zero could play comfortably, he looked incredibly strong. Sub-Zero had massive practical damage, an almost free neutral tool in clone if you couldn't challenge it. It was kind of insane, really. However, like Sub-Zero has always had to deal with, characters that didn't need to care about the clone would be extremely problematic for him, making Sub-Zero one of those characters that was varied in usefulness depending on the matchup at hand. If you could ignore clone and be in control of Sub-Zero, not the other way around, that is where we'd see the character struggle. But it's not like this is a surprise, is it? Because that's been Sub-Zero for years. If clone good, he good. If clone bad, he not so good. Sub-Zero would often sit in a solid mid-tier of the game's tier list. He was far from unviable, but there were definitely better characters more universally strong in all of the matchups. He was a very rare pick back in the Injustice 2 Pro series, and if he ever did get used, people would get excited. I mean, most of us were MK fans first, so it was nice seeing this character on screen. It seems like Sub isn't really that used in the current community either, and from what I've been able to find from the current high-level players of the Colosseum, for example, the public opinion of Sub hasn't really changed all that much. Another character whose public opinion tragically hasn't changed over time either is Raiden, the final MK character in Injustice who looks really neat and honestly maybe even a strong pick on face value, but in the world of competitive, he simply did not work. Raiden, like Sub-Zero, kept a ton of his MKX moveset, all of his strings that could be used for pressure, meter build, chip damage, and mix-ups, all of the stuff that he had in MKX is here, really, so that's definitely a good thing, in theory. The issue is that all of these buttons were point-blank only. These buttons were great in MKX because it was an aggressive, up-close and personal game, and Justice 2 wasn't. So Raiden wasn't as up close as he wanted to be most of the time. These strings and normals went from being really good in MKX to super stubby and hard to apply in Injustice. His list of specials wasn't terrible at least. It's all there. The projectile is still okay and on meter burn stuns for a bit and lets him follow up. But the startup on this is kind of slow so it won't work off every button that you use. Teleport is back as a base move which is great. But again, the recovery on regular teleport is pretty slow. You have to meter burn it to make it recover faster, which can be a bit painful when the meter is needed for other things. Shocker still works after strings for chip damage, and on hit launches when you meter burn it. Vicinity Blast comes back too, which is primarily used for certain combos. And of course, the Superman Dive. No need to go into this one because it's the classic and it works exactly as you think it does and can be done airborne. Raiden comes alive via his trait, which essentially boosts almost all of his attacks to do more stuff than they could before. He has string extensions that work like Thunder God variation in MKX, which once again builds phenomenal meter on block. But the most important side of this, arguably, is that quite a few specials are upgraded as well. The Meter Burn Shocker will now launch high enough for a back three pop-up. Vicinity Blast has them stunned for longer, giving you more room to do damage in combos. His regular down two becomes a standalone 16% button, which is a nice throwback to old school uppercut damage. But also, 
his projectile can be stopped in place for the cost of a bar. Now, this is where some of his setup potential would come from as it's slightly similar to Sub-Zero's Ice Clone, just not as frequently available. There are other things too that Trait gives, but generally, it's a massive buff, and that's all you need to know. Some specific things people often discuss with what Raiden does well is that his jump 3 is good, his down 1 low poke will combo into Shocker, and Shocker is safe on block at minus 5, so having a safe low poke check is really strong, but also his universal forward 3 overhead is actually his back 2 from MKX, and it retains the ability to special cancel the first hit, something unique to Raiden this time over. Unfortunately, Everything else is flashy, really cool looking, and even the damage is super high on some stuff, but it's not practical. And this is the biggest issue that Raiden had in the game, as you can do all kinds of combos and setups in training mode, show off some specific tricky shock trap stuff in trait with all this meter or whatever, but in a real match against characters with more range, more reach, far stronger neutral, Raiden just doesn't have the chance to land any of it. Raiden was a highly uncommon character in the world of competitive, and like Sub-Zero, when I asked the current community if anything had changed about his approach in 2022, maybe someone out there has been able to show the character is much better than we all imagined, that happens sometimes, but it doesn't seem to be the case here. Raiden has consistently been regarded as one of the weakest characters in the game because although he is fun to play and he can do all this cool stuff, he's an MKX character that's been placed into the wrong game. He just doesn't fit in Justice 2, where everyone else is able to approach the meta better than he can, he's too short range, and being able to land all of the stuff that would make him good is just not reliable against the rest of the cast if they have tools to shut down his approach. Most would likely consider him the worst character, if not for Raphael, who's a garbage can. Well, what a mixed bag we had with these three today. Thank you all so much for watching today's episode. I hope I was able to shine some light on these picks. And to be honest, it's been nice to cover Injustice again. It's been a long time since my Pro Series commentary days, that's for sure. Now I did actually make another MK crossover video last year, where I highlighted when Raiden was a playable character in Unreal Championship back in the original Xbox days, so if you want to see more of this, check that video out. On another note, make sure that you subscribe if you enjoy the content, hit the notification bell, and maybe even consider backing the Patreon, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.